Um, and yeah, so that brings us to what we're doing today. We're talking about, you know, beginner birding um, and Sarah Rupert is our, is our uh, speaker. Now, some of you may already know Sarah. She's been a bird educator, um, you know, and bird outreach professional for an extremely long time. Um, but for those of you who don't, Sarah has been birding for her entire life, literally from day one. And I think she talks about that a little bit later. And she works at Point Pelee National Park, um, where she has not missed a spring migration since her first visit at two and a half months old. Um, except for 2020, she says, because COVID changed a lot of people's lives. She's spent many years exploring the wonder of birds and nature, which she loves to share with others through interpretive programs, writing, and mixed media art, both of which she also teaches about. She eagerly awaits the arrival of spring and birders to Point Pelee every year. So you're in very good hands um, for this presentation. So I'm gonna go away and Sarah, why don't you take it away from here and I'll see you later. Perfect, I uh, just wanna make sure, can everyone see the slides? Are we good? Awesome. Well, thanks for having me today. Um, I get to talk about something that I'm extremely passionate about, which is birding. And it's great to see that there's a lot of people here that are first time birders. Uh, hopefully I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks that will help make the whole mystery world of birding a little less mysterious by the end. Uh, there's a lot of people who are asking right now if the sessions are being recorded and the answer is yes. So if you miss something and you wanna go back and review this later, please don't hesitate, um, we'll share that information later on. So what I'm gonna do is just talk to you a little bit about myself. So as Emily said, and now my, oh, sorry, I just have to move some screens around here. Okay. So I have to get PowerPoint backups. Just give me a sec here. Oh. All these multiple screens are having, having a problem here. Just bear with me for a second. I'm just gonna, I just have to make a couple changes here. No problem. We're just answering some uh, questions in the, in the chat in the meantime, as people kind of get oriented. All right. I'll let you know when we can. Okay. okay. You're... I think we are good now. Yes, we are good now. Things are advancing. Sorry about that. I just had it on a wrong setting. Um, so as Emily alluded to the fact that I am a bird person and I have been a bird person for a very long time. Um, my dad was a really amazing birder. And so, um, you know, the story goes is I probably started birding from the womb and, you know, there's also a, a, the legend is I probably was also conceived at Peely during spring migration. So birding's really in my heart and in my soul. Uh, my very first memory is actually of a bird and it was this bird here, the black-billed magpie, which I saw when I was about two and three quarters years old. Um, and, you know, big flashy black and white birds certainly registered on my um, radar screen at that time. Um, I've been very fortunate to bird my entire life. I got my first pair of binoculars when I was three and my parents were extremely smart. They found ones that were made for a boat. So they were really lightweight and they also floated. So, you know, if you're ever thinking about stuff for kids, those are two good, really good features. Um, I've been extremely fortunate to be able to spend at least a week at Peely every spring, well, at the exception of last year birding with my family. Um, we used to get pulled out of school for a, a week every year, and it was probably some of the best education I got. Uh, I landed at Point Pelee 
um, as an interpreter in the fall of 1999, and I've been there ever since, and I've been doing a bunch of different jobs, um, but I've always been the resident birding expert for the park. And it's one of my favorite things is to share my passion for birding with others. So you, if you're starting out in birding, it can be very, very intimidating. You think, oh my gosh, I need to get all the gear, I need to get all the books, I need to get all the apps, I need to get all the things. And really all you need to be someone who enjoys birds and watches birds is to have your eyes and to be able to observe or to be able to listen to what's going on out there. But there are some tools in the trade that will actually help make your birding experience even better. Now, one of the things we always think about when, with birding is binoculars. And I get asked all the time about binoculars and how, how should I buy them? How much should I spend? all of those kinds of questions. So I have some basic guidelines if you're thinking about binoculars or if you're you know, thinking, oh, I wanna upgrade or whatever um, in that range. There are a few things that you wanna look for and there's some really good features that I always look for with my, when, when I'd be purchasing binoculars. One thing is, are they waterproof? Um, so if you look at uh, binoculars, um, especially at this time of year, um, we can be birding in some pretty wet weather. If you ever want to go bird watching in, um, in tropical countries, it can be very uh, humid in some of those places. So having binoculars that are waterproof are a really great feature to look for. Um, other things to look for too are um, binoculars that are comfortable in your hands. So if you have an opportunity, and I know it's really hard in COVID times, but if you do have an opportunity when you're trying to buy your binoculars to actually test them out and hold them in your hands, um, you're going to get a real good sense as to whether they're gonna be comfortable to use or not. I think a lot of people get hung up on buying the name and not necessarily buying the, the binocular that works the best for them. The other thing you need to do before you start shopping for binoculars is to set your price range. Um, one of the, um, things that can be really tough is if you look through a $2,000 pair of binoculars and you only have $400 to uh, spend, you might end up walking out a little heartbroken because you've looked through those $2,000 binoculars. So if you have a budget in mind, just look at things in your budget. And there's a lot of great binoculars that you can get in that two to $500 range, which is what I would suggest spending um, on your first pair. <clears throat> and there are some great ones that have really great warranties. Um, you know, you can drop them off an observation tower and they'll be replaced or fixed for you. So look into your warranties as well. The other thing I always get asked about binoculars too is what the numbers mean on a pair of binoculars. So um, if you look at um, binoculars and the ones that are on the uh, slide right now, those are my binoculars. I think I got them in 1996 and I'm still going strong with them and they are 10 by 42s. So the first number is the magnification time. So it's 10 times magnification and 42 is the field of view. So when you're looking at a field of view, it just is how much you get to see through your binoculars and larger fields of view are great, but they make the binoculars a lot more shaky when you're looking through them. So if you're, if you've got a 10 by 42, you might find that's a little shaky and unstable for you. You might be more comfortable with an eight by 42. Um, if you're planning on doing most of your birding in the woods, eight power binoculars are perfect for that. Um, if you're like me and you like to look at stuff out over the lake, you might wanna go up to the 10 power. So that's just a little brief um, talk about binoculars. I could go on for much further, but I think the other thing to remember too is your binoculars, they're not just like a one-year investment. The, they aren't going to become obsolete. Like we kind of get used to it. You know, we've all got, you know, our phones and other technology that become obsolete in a couple of years. Binoculars are going to last you. So it's an investment. And so it's one of those things, if you're thinking about it over a long-term investment, um, spending a little bit more money, but you're gonna have them for a long time. You're not gonna have to replace them in three years with the latest model because the, you know, the software won't work with it anymore. That's the nice part about binoculars. 
All right. So another thing we want to talk about is field guides. And I'm sure everybody might have favorite field guides. And if you want to throw up some of your favorite field guides in the chat, we'd love to see them. There's basically two kinds of field guides you can get. You can either get an illustrated guide or a photographic guide. And there are pluses and minuses to both of those guides. I personally tend to prefer an illustrated guide, um, probably because I'm an artist and I enjoy seeing the artwork. But the other things that um, an illustrated guide does is it kind of makes uh, the artists that do these sketches kind of synthesize all, a bunch of different individuals into almost like a generic form. Because when you're out there and as you're getting more into birding and as you're looking at birds more closely, you're gonna notice some variations amongst individuals. So it's it's just like, there's a lot of variation amongst us as people, but you know, birds might just all look at us as, oh, there's more of those humans. But if the birds were looking more closely at us, they'd notice differences between us. So what the, um, field guide does is it tends to homo like it basically kind of synthesizes a generic version of that species. So that's what an illustrated guide can do. A photographic guide so are great because sometimes you, you get a better sense of color um, some, and you can get context of habitat and things like that as well. But the thing to remember is that it is one individual captured at one point in time. So it might not look exactly like the individual you're looking at. And I remember being leading a birding hike at Peely and we were, we were down near the tip area and I could hear a dick sisal calling and a dick sisal has a really great call note that sounds all like basically like someone's farting. So it's a pretty distinctive sound. And as soon as I heard it, I was really excited and, and was like, okay, where's the bird? Let's get on it, let's see it. And somebody started arguing with me that it wasn't a dick sizzle because it didn't look like the bird in their book. So we have to remember that there is variation in birds, there's different ages in birds, there's differences in sexes. And depending on the book that you have, it may not illustrate all of those different versions. So just think about those things. I see a lot of people are talking about Sibley um, and National Geographic is another great one. Um, there are uh, like Sibley, as you can tell, is one of my favorites. I love the National Geographic. Uh, Peterson's Birds is a classic and you know he's the one who really got the whole idea of field marks and pointing at things on birds. Um, into our psyche. So there's a lot of great books out there. And I think the, the challenge is to find one that works for you. Like this Sibley guide for me um, is great, but I would never carry it around in the field with me because it's too heavy. So that's another consideration you may want to look at. There's an Eastern version of Sibley that's a lot more, a lot smaller, a lot easier to carry, or, you know, you can get um, electronic versions that you can carry on your phone as well. Now, when we talk about apps, one of the great apps for beginning birders is Merlin. And I'm not sure how many people have seen Merlin um, uh, before or used it, but Merlin's a really neat program. And I remember when they were developing Merlin, they had sent out a, a request to um, experienced birders to go in and identify photographs. And what they were doing is we were actually teaching Merlin how to identify things. So they would ask us what we thought the main colors were on the bird um, and, and various things about the bird, which eventually led to the development of the, the um, kind of the logarithms for identification with this app. But I, what I really like about Merlin is it's not just a, I saw a bird that was yellow, what is it? It actually makes you start to think about things in birding, which helps with identification. So it asks you date, which is important. It asks you location. It asks you habitat. It asks you size. And it doesn't say, ask you if it's, um, you know, 10 centimeters long. It asks you, is it sparrow sized? Is it robin sized? Is it Canada goose sized? or is it somewhere in between these sizes? So it gets you thinking about size relatively, which is also important. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And it will use eBird data, which I'm also gonna talk about in a little bit, um, 
which is this massive database. So it's basically pulling from sightings in your area and pulling together the most likely species it is based on your description. It doesn't always get it right, and that's okay too. Every time you get it right, um, it actually logs in with Merlin and it learns as it goes. So the system is continually improving as well. And it's even got features now where you can upload photos and have IDs come from the photos. So it's come so far since its initial stages and it's a really great spot to start with when you're looking at apps. I know there's some other um, uh, apps out there that a lot of people like. This is the one that I, be, I recommend for starting with. Um, the, the Sibley Bird app is great. I have it on my phone um, and it's a great reference. Um, and I use it all the time as well. A lot of people like iBird, Audubon ones. There's just, there's lots of them out there. But if you're looking for something to really help you um, with bird identification, Merlin's a good one. And I always get asked about bird song and there is one called Song Sleuth. It's tougher um, to get teach uh, a computer essentially to identify bird song uh, because of the variation with birds and because of similar songs. But it does a fairly good job. And it's again, it's a good starting point and it's gonna give you some suggestions. And um, then you can kind of follow through and figure out if that's what you're seeing. One of the things that I think is incredibly important is a field notebook. And this is something that kind of I've, I've found has gone by the wayside, especially in the last 10 years. Um, you know, everyone's just recording everything on their phone, but there's something about a field notebook or a field sketchbook that is really rewarding. And especially when you're first starting out can be so helpful in learning birds. This is a, a page from one of my field notebooks. Um, I am notoriously bad for starting and then putting the book somewhere and then pulling another one out. So I ha often have multiples going, but as long as I've got date, location, time, weather, and the birds in it, I'm good to go. So some days I do a lot of sketching. Other days it's just lists of birds that I've seen. And if there was anything significant, I might write some notes down about it. It's similar to keeping an eBird list, but one of the things that a field notebook does is um, if you're trying to describe something and you're writing it down in words, it makes connections in your brain that will never happen if you're just typing it into a phone or on your computer. Um, there's you know, been some interesting brain science work that's been done that shows when you actually hand write things down, it helps you remember things better. So that's one of the things that I think is really important. Um, in this one, I was studying Bonaparte skulls because I was planning on painting them. And I discovered something new about Bonaparte skulls that day, um, that they have these bright orangey red feet, but they have black toenails. And I'd never noticed that before. I was very excited about it. And I have notes about how they have black toenails. So it encourages you to explore the bird and actually really write down what you're seeing about it. And this can be helpful when you find a bird that you don't know what it is. If you have a field notebook and you can write down as many notes about what you're seeing on that bird, you might not identify it on the spot. You might not identify it for a couple of weeks, but you're gonna have all those great notes that will help you identify it eventually. Now there's some other great resources out there that I'm just gonna mention. Um, eBird is a great place, <coughs> especially at this time of year. Um, lots and lots of people are asking, you know, when are the Orioles gonna be back? When should I put up my hummingbird feeder? Um, and, and, and when do the warblers start arriving? So one of the great resources you have is eBird. Um, and this is a place where you can share your observations and you can see other people's observations. And what it will allow you to do is you can actually go in and search a species and see where is it being seen right now. Um, or you can search your um, area. And you know, especially at these times where we're not moving around very much, it might be worthwhile like pulling up a list for your neighborhood park and seeing what kind of birds are around you. You'll probably be surprised as to what you can find. Um, Larkwire is probably, I, I think it's my favorite place to learn bird song um, because it's set up like a game and it's not just listening to a bird song and then, 
you know, hear the name, listen to the song, hear the name, listen to the song, which is what a lot of those recordings are like. This one actually gives you four similar sounding birds and you have to play through around and get all the birds right a certain number of times. But what happens if you get something wrong, it knocks out all of your score for that bird and the bird you mistaken it for. So it really helps you track and it tracks your progress. It makes recommendations for what to do next. It's a really great source. You can, um, you can download the app or you can do it on the web. So it's LarkWire. And then the other thing I want to tell people about is allaboutbirds.org. And um, I see a lot of people going to Dr. Google trying to identify birds. And Dr. Google um, is not really that great at IDing birds in a lot of cases. And I see a lot of people, you know, they're trying to figure out what something is and they're you know, they look at Google images and they find a bird that looks similar, but it's from, you know, uh, South America or Africa, and it's not that bird. <laughs> it's not what we're seeing here. So All About Birds has great range maps, um, and it has um, uh, lots of information about birds, lots of different imagery. Um, tells you about habits, it tells you about nesting, it tells you about how they feed. It's a really, really excellent resource. Um, the name of the app suggested to learn bird song and sounds is LarkWire. Um, the one that if you want to take it into the field to try an idea bird song is called Song Sleuth. All right, so let's get into it. Um, when we are starting out birding, I really think it is so important to start in an area that you're familiar with. And, you know, we're in a place right now with COVID and and, and our lockdown that we're exploring our, our backyards, our neighborhoods, um, off of our balconies, looking out our windows so much more than we have ever before. And it's actually a great place to start when you're beginning birding. And the reason I say that is you're familiar with your surroundings. So um, I have a feeling that a lot of people, if you've tried using binoculars before, have had the experience where you put your binoculars up to look at something and you're nowhere near where um, you wanted to look. And uh, how many people have had that experience before? I, I think a lot of people probably have. I know I have. Um, I know that when I was a little kid, that was a challenge for me. So my dad recognized that it was a challenge and he used to take us out in the backyard to do binocular drills. And I, I must tell you, I think our neighbors probably thought we were a little nutty, um, you know, but we were a nice family, just a little weird, a little too into nature, but we'd be out in the backyard and my dad would be like, okay, I want you to look at the red pine. And we know where the red pine is in the yard and you get your binoculars on it. But the thing that was nice about it is if you aimed your binoculars and you got it wrong and you got the clothesline instead of the red pine, you knew where the two were in relation to one another and you were able to start to make those corrections. And the more you practice like that, you're actually gonna automatically start to correct yourself. Now, one of the other things um, that I will suggest too when you're looking um, through binoculars, because I think one of the biggest problems people make is it's it's a really simple little thing but they'll be looking at something and then they look down at their binoculars and lift them up and try and get on it and inevitably you're not going to be on what you want to look at so try and get in and this is where you can practice again is focus on something and lift your binoculars up to your eyes then you're going to be looking at what you want to look at so it's just a really simple little thing but starting out in those familiar spaces is is great and also too if you're working in you know like I, i'm looking out in my yard right now as i'm talking to you and it's actually not really a yard it's the view from my condo so i have a hedgerow of cedars that is full of house sparrows um there's a bunch of grackles around and i'm really enjoying seeing tree swallows swooping around outside my window so really not a lot of bird species so it gives me time to focus on things and, and, and look at their behaviors a little bit more and you know really see the birds um, as opposed to going to someplace that I'm completely unfamiliar with. Um, it, it's a lot more challenging, especially when you're first starting out. 
Um, the other thing that I always recommend to people too is to learn to bird ethically. And you may wonder, what does that mean? Well, really what we wanna try and do when we're out and birding, and this does become important in, in some of the practices that we do through the atlasing process, is that we do not want to put the birds that we are enjoying in jeopardy, nor do we want to put their habitats in jeopardy. And we also want to respect others while we're out there as well. So, you know, respecting that some areas are private property and, you know, as much as we are dying to see what's in that woodlot, we shouldn't be in there without permission. Or, you know, if it's a really rare bird and there's a huge mob, and this will happen at Point Pelias, you'll just get people mobbed around something like this Kirtland's warbler in the picture here. And that can put a lot of stress on a migratory bird. So we have to kind of think about what our actions are and make sure that our passion, love, and desire to see things isn't putting the birds at detriment. So if you want to learn more, more about birding ethics, there's lots of places you can visit. There's links on the Atlas website. There's um, to the Ontario Field Ornithologist page. You can look at the American Birding Association. Um, and if you know, you're looking for French language um, resources. Quebec Oiseau has a really great section on ethical birding as well. So what we're going to do now is we are going to um, identify a mystery bird. And I've purposely picked a terrible photo because let's be honest, when do we, all, when do we get really great photos or looks at everything we're going to look at. So one of the things that you can do is look at this little chart here and figure out where your bird falls into in this chart. So when we're looking at birds, generally speaking, and this is very general, there's always exceptions to this, this rule, but generally speaking, you can separate birds into two main groups, water birds and land birds. And here's the really cool part about it is once you've made that separation, you also know if you should be looking in the front half or the back half of your field guide. Because your field guide's set up in taxonomic order, um, and a lot of that, I, I know a lot of people find that conundrum, uh, it's a bit of a conundrum when you're first starting out. Um, you know, for me, an alphabetical bird book drives me nuts because I just learned taxonomic order like I learned ABCs. Um, so for me, it's not, it's, it's never been an issue taxonomic order, but I know for some people, when you first open a bird book, it can be really confusing and a little intimidating. Like where do I even go to look for something? So knowing that the water birds in tax are generally speaking in ta are earlier in the taxonomic order and the land birds are later, you know which half of your field guide to start looking through. So that's a, that's a huge load off. You've basically eliminated about half of your field guide just by distinguishing whether it's a water bird or land bird, which I guarantee you're already doing in your brain. You're just not consciously doing it. And then, so if we're on the water bird side, basically there's kind of three main groups that you're gonna look at. There's birds that spend most of their time in the water swimming. So those would be things like ducks and loons and, um, you know, um, grebes, cormorants, things like that. Those are the ones that spend most of their time in and around the water swimming. Then there's a group that will spend most of their time in and around the water flying. And these would be more like your terns and your gulls and, you know, and your skuas and things like that. And then there's another group that spends a good chunk of its time walking or wading in the water. So that would be a lot of your shorebirds would fit into that category, your herons, your cranes, those types of birds. Then we get over to the land bird side. We kind of have four main groups again. And again, there, there's always exceptions to the rules, but at least it helps you kind of figure out where to go. Game birds are things like wild turkeys and pheasants. Um, and grouse and things like that. So stuff people would eat. Raptors, those are our birds of prey. That would also include vultures and falcons, all kind of fit into that group and tend to be in the same area of the field guide. Aerial land birds, this is one that often will make people think a little bit. 
So these are the, the birds that are over the land, but they spend most of their time up and flying. So these would be things like my tree swallows that I've been watching today, chimney swifts, birds like that. And then finally, we have that group of birds, the passerines, the songbirds, which I think a lot of people, that's what helps get them into birding. So those are things like our tanagers and our warblers and our orioles. These are birds that actually sing. So let's take a look at this bird again. So I think we already intuitively know that it is a land bird. I, I think everyone will agree with me on that. Um, and so which group does it fall into? Is it a game bird? Doesn't look like a turkey to me or, or a grouse or it's just not the right shape. Um, it definitely is not a raptor. Um, we can see that. Um, is it an aerial land bird? doesn't look like a swallow or a swift to me. So I think it's gonna fit into that songbird category. So now we know that it's a songbird. So now we know that it's gonna be like the, you know, blackbird and oriole family or the warbler family or the cardinals and their allies or sparrows. Those kinds of birds are what we're looking at and trying to figure it out from there. So let's, let's look at this bird and really take a look at it. And when, when, when we want to look at it, we want to look at the size and the shape of the bird. So again, it's very hard sometimes to tell size in the field. So if this bird was standing next to or was in with another type of bird that you knew. So let's imagine that this bird was, you know, it's hopping around on the lawn. So there could have been a robin there. So is it the same size as the robin? Is it a little bit bigger? Is it a little bit smaller? Um, so we can look at the size from that perspective. We can also look at the shape of the bird. So, um, and you can say like, is it shaped like a robin? Is it shaped like a sparrow? What, what, what's the general shape that you're getting from this bird? You can talk about the body shape. Um, you know, some birds, um, you know, like uh, I, I think about like American woodcock's a good example. I think their body shape looks like a dumpy potato. Uh, so that's how I would describe it. It looks like a dumpy potato. Um, this bird, it's, it looks pretty streamlined to me. It doesn't look like a really, you know, like, you know, if you, if you see things like wrens, they look like chunky little nuggets, but this doesn't have that. It has kind of a sleeker, more streamlined look to it. We want to look at the shape of the beak. So when you look at the shape of the beak, it's pretty pointy. And it's quite long. And when I talk about it being quite long, I'm thinking about it in ratio and perspective to the, the head. So one of the measurements that I often use to help myself in the field um, to get a sense of how big a bill is on a bird is not to look specifically at the bill, but to look at the length of the bill. So kind of from the base of the bill to the tip of the bill, and then compare that to the base of the bill to the back of the head. And this one is almost, it's just a little bit less, but it's pretty close to the same width as the head. So it's a fairly long, it's quite pointy and looks pretty strong bill on it. Um, the shape of the body, it's kind of like a, uh, I'd say it's a pretty sleek football. It's not a big, well inflated football, kind of sleek. Um, and then the other thing we wanna look at is the tail and describe it, is it forked? Is it notched? Is it how long is it compared to the length of the body? And in this case, the tail length looks about half the length of the body. And then we want to look at coloration and field marks. So I always think about um, uh, this kind of from a if I was going to paint a perspective. So I would talk about kind of the base color is this, and then it has this color streaks on top. It's kind of hard to tell from this one, but you can see some streaks in here. It's a pretty brownish and streaky looking bird. So does anyone have any guesses? And you can throw them up in the chat. I see um, some people are already throwing some up. Someone asked, is it a cowbird? Someone said, that's a guess too. All right. OK, I'm seeing a few guesses here. Brown-headed cowbird, brown-headed cowbird, brown, gross beak, female ruffling blackbird, cowbird, brown thrasher. All right. Sometimes you need to see the male next to it, and it is a female red-winged blackbird. And I will tell you that this is a bird that every birder will have 
their moment of struggle with. I had it, everyone has it. I've seen it so many times at the park. It's people will either bring in a photo or will be somewhere and they'll be like, Sarah, what is that? And the, the challenge with a female red-winged blackbird is it has a lot of field marks that are similar to other birds, but the shapes aren't right. And when you look at it and you compare the shape to the male red wing, it makes total sense. Um, but the cowbird guess was very good too, because you were all getting into the right family. So congratulations, everyone, you're doing very well. So I wanna talk a little bit about how you can get involved in the Atlas, even if you aren't an expert birder, because there is a place for everyone and there are things that everybody can do to help. So if you're just casually birding, um, even just in your neighborhood or, or um, in, in different areas, and you know, let's say you see things like a robin's nest. A lot of us will find a robin's nest this spring. Um, you can do some general atlasing. So this is kind of a, a, a slow way to start. You, you do things and you submit records that you're completely 100% sure on. And that's the thing that um, we really ask of everybody is, don't put it in if you aren't 100% sure. Record it, make notes about it. If you need some advice, there's always people that can help you out, but don't put it into the actual data set until you're 100% sure of what it is that you're seeing. And this is a great way um, to get started. So, you know, you probably will have a robin, you might have a cardinal nesting in your yard, maybe you've got a really messy house sparrow nest, or you've got a red You've got a little um, nest box up and you get a wren in your yard and you get to see the babies and it's really exciting. Those are all observations that are important and can contribute to the Atlas data. The other thing you can do is this is a five year project. So you have time to build those skills. So you might just start with simple data submission like you know the robin's nest on your front porch light and as your skills move up, you'll be able to move up and do more things as well. And eventually you might be able to get to the point where you're out doing point counts and, and listening for birds. So it's amazing how much skill you can develop. And one of the things that's really important is to remember that practicing is important. Getting out and just observing is important. Even if you're observing what you know, people might call dirt birds or common birds. Every observation you make helps you build your skill set. And the way that I like to approach looking at birds is if you're out there and you're really looking at birds and you're taking notes and you're breaking the bird down like we talked about in our ID session, you're really learning birds. And you might see a bird and you might say, I don't know what that is. I've taken all these notes. I've really looked at this bird. When you're really starting to learn is if you go out three days later and you see that same species, you still don't know what the name is, but you're like, hey, that's that bird I saw three days ago. It's the same bird. I recognize that it's the same. And, you know, you might say, I still don't know what it is. You know, um, I'm gonna have to ask my birding friend at some point but I know that's the same bird. I'm gonna call him Steve for now. And eventually you might learn that Steve's name is black third of green warbler. But what's the most important thing is that you learned what Steve looks like and you recognized him again later. And that's when you're really starting to progress and learn um, with your birding. So looking at things over and over again is actually really helpful for birding. Another thing that can be helpful in reinforcing what you're seeing as well is if you've gone out, you've done some birding, you've taken your notes, you've you know, got your list together, sit down with your field guide at night and go through all the things that the experts tell you you should see on that bird and find out then say, hmm, I didn't see that on that bird. I'm gonna go out birding tomorrow. I'm gonna try and find another, you know, chestnut-sided warbler and I'm gonna look for that field mark. That's something we used to do when we were kids. And it was great because then it was a challenge the next day to go and find that bird again and to find the thing that we hadn't seen before on it. So there's lots of things you can do, continue to bird this, build your skills. Oh, sorry. So 
Another way to get involved is with the owl in the night jar surveys. These are really good um, beginning points as well because um, there's very limited species. The survey uses callback and the, song, the calls are very easy to learn. Um, so this is a way that you could get involved um, and not have a ton of experience or a ton of burning knowledge. Um, another way to get involved is to actually go out and record point counts. So you don't need any skills except to be able to operate the recording system. And what you would do is you follow the point count protocol, but instead of you recording information on a data sheet, you're just standing there following the protocol recording with this, with the device. And then somebody else will analyze the data at a later time. So this is really, really important. Um, information it helps cover areas that might not get covered in the atlas because we just don't have enough people to do every single spot that we want so you could go out and make that recording and it's super super important it's going to get us information but you don't have to do all the identification and then finally there's lots of ways you can get involved that don't involve birding so say you have really great computer skills or graphic design skills, um, or you want to volunteer in some way, you can always contact the Atlas. Uh, I've just thrown the address up there. It's on, on atlas at birdscanada.org and find out well, how could you help? You know, <clears throat> uh, hopefully, you know, we may have events in the future where we can actually get together in the same place. We might need some volunteers to help coordinate those things. So in summary today, I want you to really see birds when you're out there. So don't just look at a bird, say, oh, it's that and walk away. I want you to really look at birds. I want you to take notes. And this is a great habit to get into. Um, you know, I had to do journals when I was a kid. That was part of the deal. You were out of school, you had to still do school type stuff. So I had to write up journal notes on uh, or do drawings about things I saw every day. There's a lot of ice cream in those, but that's good. Um, and scarlet tanagers, but I still was taking notes and recording my observations. Use your ears while you're out there. If you hear something that's interesting, go find the bird that's making the sound. Um, when you see a bird singing, it also helps you make that connection and remember song better. Use the tools that you have. We have so many great tools at our advantage. Um, so use those tools. Um, they're not going to instantly make you a better um, at identifying birds, but they're tools to help you get there. And I think the big thing is to not get stressed out. I see a lot of people, you know, especially in, in May, trying to see everything and getting way stressed out about things. This should be enjoyable for us. <laughs> we, we like to watch birds. There's an enjoyment factor in there for us. So get out there, have fun. If you can't identify something, take notes. Don't worry about it. Um, try and figure it out later. And at the very least, try and get involved in Atlas 3 because we'd love to have you join us um, in the process. So I am finished for, to, for my presentation portion. I think we're in a good spot. Almost right on time, actually. Yeah, way to go. That was like <laughs> to the second perfect, Sarah. Um, I don't know if everybody can see me too, but I my camera's on if, for those of you who can. Oh, there I am. Um, we had a number of questions, actually. And yeah, we'll, we'll talk about them. The first one that I wrongfully dismissed, so I want to get to it before I forget about it, and it's a great question, is about tips for birders who wear glasses. And I fall into this category myself, so I know uh, it was a bit of a learning curve. Yes, tips for birders who wear glasses. So um, I guess the first question to ask yourself is what kind of glasses do you wear? Are they reading glasses like what I have on right now? I would never wear these birding. Um, uh, I. I'll, I'll struggle and try and read the small print on my phone. But what you really want to do is look for eye caps that are adjustable. So if you have glasses that you wear all the time, um, they've really come a long way. I remember way back, you used to have to fold down the cup on an eye on binoculars 
And so you can put glasses up against them. Now you can adju adjust the eye cup. So if you are not wearing them with glasses, you normally would have the eye cups rotated up, but you can rotate them down so they're very flush with the, um, uh, with the glass that you're looking through and then use those with your glasses. So good question. Excellent question. And it takes a little bit of time. Um, I work on, for, personally, I wear contact lenses and I thought I had to bird that way for a really long time, but it's actually, you, you get used to it pretty quickly once you get to adjust your eye cups. I think it's one of those things too. It's, it's all about the practicing. Mm -hmm. And there's also things too that you can do to ad individually adjust your binoculars to your eyes. Yes. So on, on um, the right hand, there's, I'm sure there's videos on YouTube about it, but there's there's adjustments, plus and minus adjustments on the right, usually it's on the right eyepiece. So when you look through your binoculars, um, you look through, just kind of cover the right eyepiece, look through it and focus. And then you cover the left eyepiece and then you adjust the right so that it's sharp. And then that will individualize your binoculars to your eyes, so. Very good for avoiding eye strain too. There's lots of videos on YouTube showing you how yeah. to do that. That's a good one. Um, here's a question that a lot of beginner birders wouldn't know, and you mentioned it, especially when you're talking about owl surveys. Do you want to explain what callback means? Ah, callback. Well, um, I, I will explain it, um, and I'll explain it in the way I usually explain it when I'm doing the owl prowl at uh, Point Peely. Um, essentially, when you're using callback, um, you are playing a recording of a bird and trying to get them to respond to you. And owls are, are ones that will respond when they're on territory pretty readily. The thing is, is, is you're kind of being a jerk when you do this. And, and I always say this to people because I don't want people to think that this is the be all and end all to how to get birds and find birds because it isn't a good thing to do repetitively. So when we're doing it for the Atlas, we're following a very specific protocol that we know is not going to disrupt a territory or breeding. So if you sat and played a song over and over and over and over and over again, you're either gonna super stress that bird out or you might make it leave its nesting habitat. So when we're using callback, we have to be very careful with it because essentially what we're pretending to be is another owl saying, hey, I'm in this territory and this looks really good to me and then the other owl is responding back saying, hey, dude, area's already taken, get lost, is essentially the conversation that's being had between you and the owl when you use callback. So that's why I say we're being a bit of a jerk, because mm -hmm. we're making the owl think that somebody's trying to take his territory. So we don't want to do this um, for long periods of time, and especially yeah. not to get a photograph either. That's something I see that's when I talk about ethics that's not ethical bird behavior. If you're playing an alarm note or, or something to try and get a bird to either have an alarm response like a ruby crown kinglet putting its crown all the way up um, or a bird that's quite secretive to come out, that's not ethical. You're, you're going way out of your way and you're stressing and, and causing a stress reaction in that bird that sometimes can take them just from a a physi physiological point of view, a day to recover from in some cases during breeding season. That's definitely true. Yeah, you think it's just for a moment, but I mean, I've had to do playback for bird surveys for work um, to, you know, collect birds and take blood samples. And sometimes you'll go back to a location hours later and still find that bird agitated. So that's yeah. a really, really great point. Um, Okay, here's one. So Peggy Hutchison wants to know, what if a bird is, you know, you went through your method of identifying birds and, you know, divvying them up into different categories, which was super helpful. But what if it's like a very confusing bird, like a confusing fall warbler, a term I hate, but that's not the point, uh, a difficult to identify a bird. And so you're almost sure what it is, but you don't know what are the best kind of ways to put it, your, your sighting out to the community to kind of get your ID answered. That's, that's a great, um, a great question. So there's, there's um, some, there's lots of Facebook groups out there. Um, I admin the Ontario birds one. So that's one if you're, if you're a member of that and you have a bird and you're like, I think I know what this is, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Then you can post that and always, always, always anywhere you're posting or asking for suggestions or help, make sure you include the date you saw the bird, 
and the location you saw the bird because um, there's nothing more frustrating than you're looking at something and you're 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 assuming it was seen in Ontario but they saw it in like Southern California like it helps people <laughs> put it into context to be able to identify things and that's something else too is when you're looking at those birds and identifying them look at range maps too so that might even help if you're down to two species and one's in southern california and one's in ontario it's most likely the one that's in ontario not to say that it couldn't be the southern california bird things happen but it's more likely going to be that so can I add one thing that just I found online when people look for IDs <laughs> is that sometimes people w haven't gotten a photograph or something, which is great. I mean, I never get photographs and that's fine, but they'll find a picture online that they think is the same bird species and they'll post that. And that can be very misleading because often it's not the same species. So if exactly. for, for instance, seeing like European bird species posted saying, I saw this in my backyard in Ontario, what is it? And everybody gets very excited. Yeah. but you that you pulled that off the internet so just be very mindful of that sort of thing too yeah and i think your description is far more valuable than a photo you think kind of looks like your bird totally yes so like and that's why i say take the notes about the birds as you're looking through them um the other thing that i forgot to mention too but is just as important is behavior what is your bird doing there are birds that have very specific behaviors. Like think about Eastern Phoebe. If most of us who've seen Eastern Phoebe know they wag their tails. And then, you know, there's a lot of different birds that have behaviors like that, that, you know, that because there are, you know, five warbler species that wag their tails. Definitely. And so, yes, you know, and if you come to my warbler presentation with the festival with Point Pelee in a couple of weeks, you can learn all of these things. So it's, there's, there's things you can learn um, and behaviors that you can find that will also help you figure stuff out as well. So if you're like trying to figure out, um, I know a lot of people struggle with flycatchers, peewees and, and, and phoebes are ones that get confused. Um, so when you're looking at that, the, that tail wagging behavior immediately separates the two. So knowing those mm -hmm. behaviors too can also be really helpful. And also where they are, you know, in the canopy, things like, yeah, totally. So remember, that's actually a really excellent point that I have never, I haven't heard a lot of people make, um, you know, is yeah. that your written description, your observations of being there with it is better than any photograph that you kind of think looks similar. So, yeah. so key. A couple of others that are really, so there's been, a, oh, this is kind of an interesting ethical one. Um, Spence Spracklin here wants to know kind of where pishing comes into the whole kind of playback and attracting birds kind of ethical issue. Yeah, that's, that's a really, um, that's, it's one of those tougher ones. Um, because I think a lot of us pish and we know how important <laughs> it can and, and how useful a tool it can be. Um, I think it really comes down to circumstance and where you are, and what time of year it is. And what environment you're in. So if you're in, say, a national park like Point Pelee in the middle of May when there's thousands of other people around, pishing's probably not a great idea. Mm -hmm. If it's the dead of winter at Point Pelee and there's four other people in the park and you do a little pish and you get some birds to react to you, then it's it it I don't have as the same issue with it. So it's it's that context of it. It's also, I'm not trying to get a bird to come off its nest in the middle of winter. I'm just trying to make a sound that makes the birds interested. What they have, um, uh, uh, there is, uh, I have to dig it out because I always forget where it is, but someone did do a study that compared callback to pishing. And the uh, response on a hormonal level is very different. The callback, um, made a hormonal response in birds, whereas the pishing might have stressed them, but they recover from it a lot faster because it's not um, it's, it's not that hormonal, I'm breeding, I'm gonna have a reaction to hearing another male in my territory kind of thing. So um, I think it's about where you do it, about when you do it and why you're doing it. If you're pishing to you try works. and get a better picture, probably not. If you're pishing because 
you know, you can hear a bunch of little chippy notes around and you just do it like, psh, psh, and you know, like the, all the winter birds are in your face going, <laughs> who are you? What are you? What is that? That's not the same thing. So, totally. so it, for those of you who are you curious want. about what pishing is, um, Sarah just did it a little bit, but it's basically making kind of a generalized sound that birds think sounds a little bit like an, maybe an alarm call of a bird or they're it sounds bird-like enough that they're curious to come check it out. And people do it in all sorts of different ways. Normally it sounds something like this, but other people kind of kiss their hand, make those noises. Yeah. It's just kind of, yeah, There's bird some enough noises. Things that you, you <laughs> hear, you know, mine's, mine's pretty simple, but again, um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's all about context and circumstance. So, and it, it, it can get a little nuanced and that's sometimes where it can be a little bit tough. I think we have time for one more question and we're going to take it back to kind of absolute basics. Um, someone was curious, Gabriella mentions this for Point Pelee, but I think it would be helpful if you answered it kind of for everybody. Like what's the best time they say to, you know, go birding. Can you talk about kind of time of day, time of year, just kind yeah. of how to navigate that? Well, and I guess it all depends on what kind of birds you want to see. That's kind of the key. But if we're talking songbird migration, which is what I think is on everybody's brains right now, I know like all of us are kind of in that phase where we're all kind of twitchy. Like, when is it going to happen? <laughs> um, generally speaking, Southern Ontario, first three to four weeks in May is when we see the bulk of the songbirds move through our area. And um, earlier in the day is when you're going to have more bird activity. So if you imagine that, you know, these birds have um, most, a lot of them have flown all night. They're stopped in the morning and they're often actively feeding. And um, then they'll settle in a little bit, you know, so usually you kind of find in that kind of six to 10 range in the morning is when they're the most active. Then they kind of settle down and have a little siesta and then you'll see the activity pick up again at the end later in the day. So kind of, you know, you, birds will be active through the day, but you'll see more activity and sometimes birding just before sunset can be fantastic as well in the spring. You know, find a spot, you know, where you're getting really nice sun from uh, like on the west. Like for me, I would go to the west side of the park where it's really sunny. We know that's where the insects are going to be. And that's where you know the bugs are going to be. Watch for midge hatchouts in uh, or big insect hatchouts. If you've got a big hatchout of insects, you're going to see birds around them. Mm -hmm. um, this time of year, anywhere where there's flowering trees, there'll be insects. So, and you know, flowering trees aren't all pretty flowers. Sometimes they're kind of dull and green flowers, but anywhere where there's trees flowering, there will be insects. So that's another good spot to look for birds as well. So. We covered a lot. Well, I think we're, we are out of time. It's 12. Um, there are a lot of questions about atlasing, birding, but guys, I'll remind you that just because we didn't get to it today with Sarah, um, there are many other sessions on, especially on the atlasing aspect, like how to atlas, how to submit your data, you know, what, how to categorize behaviors, etc. So please do stick around for some of the other sessions um, and hopefully you'll get your questions answered there. So that was so good. Thank you so much. What a great oh. uh, presentation. And we had like over 230 people watching. So that's wonderful. Excellent. That's <laughs> wonderful. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, and, you know, if you're ever down Peely Way when the visitor center is open again, we'll, I'll be around and um, ask for me. I'd be happy to come out and say hi. So enjoy your spring and enjoy birding wherever you are right now especially if it's your first spring birding, because it's oh, a very magical time in your life. It is. <laughs> and I will tell you that I birded from my balcony last year because I couldn't go into the park. And my May list was over 100 species just from my balcony. So it's incredibly possible to see lots of things in, in uh, not prime habitat. So 